Tech for Senior. It is September the 20th, 2021. Welcome everyone. We have, wow, we have 90 people today in the audience and a whole bunch more over uh, on our YouTube service. So, uh, so welcome everyone. This is, this is exciting. As I said many times in the past, your enthusiasm sort of keeps us going and that's, uh, that's great. That really is, thank you so much for coming. Uh, let me just go over the meeting format today for everybody, uh, for you. Um, what we're going to be doing is uh, for the first uh, 60 minutes, we'll be having our meeting. Uh, this will be followed by a Q&A of 20 minutes. Then you get a bit of a bathroom break, and then we will start our premiere service, which of course is on our YouTube channel. And I discussed that a little bit in the, uh, in the meeting before. Today on the premiere service, I'll be talking on uh, how to choose a new PC. And Huey's going to be talking on file management. I think you're talking about that today, aren't you, Huey? Is that? Yes. Yeah, you're a, you're a file sort of guy. So that's, uh, yeah, so that'll, that'll be cool. So that's, uh, that's going to happen. Now, those over on our YouTube channel, of course, will be, um, we'll be stopping the meeting at about 20, uh, about 10 minutes to the hour just before Ray's music segment. And if you want to hop on over, uh, not sure how many spots we'll have open because we we're up to 92 now, so it might fill up. So you may or may not get in by the end of the meeting if you want to hop over and participate in our Q and A sessions. So uh, thanks so thanks so much for coming. Now, also uh, in addition to um, our uh, our show today, we we uh, we run a show on Thursday called Tech for Senior Live, and uh, what we do is we talk about all the articles on our Facebook page. Now, for those of you who don't know, we post, the four of us all post uh, articles regarding our uh, Facebook page, and we keep, um, keep all the articles, and so we talk about that on Thursday morning. Uh, who's got, uh, we've got a mic on, uh, Bob. Uh, I, I'll mute her. Okay, there you go. So we're going to, uh, so, so we're, this, uh, and this week coming is going to be Jim Gould from Geeks on Tour. You, uh, he's going to be our guest speaker and uh, guest on. So we get to talk about technology. We had uh, 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 Bill on last week and we did gadgets. So it'll be interesting to see. Jim can tell us all about his travels this summer with Chris and any, uh, any stuff on technology that he has had. So, that's, uh, so that will be uh, coming up this Thursday. Uh, also this Thursday... Uh, which I'll uh, we'll get to in a moment. We have a Chromebook session coming up, and Huey's going to tell us all about that in a few minutes. Uh, so that's sort of our plan. So let me introduce everybody. Uh, my co-host today, Huey Poplick. Do you want to say hello and tell us what are we doing on Thursday, Huey? Uh, I don't know. What are we doing on Thursday? Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, let's see. Thursday we have uh, uh, the uh, Tech for Senior Live, of course. And then uh, later on, we have our learning Chromebooks, where we talk about Chromebooks for an hour. We do. Now, listen, if they do they have to register for it if they've been before? They certainly do. And they can find the link to the registration on the Tech for Senior website or on Huey.net. But if they've registered before, they're not, they don't have to re-register. If you've been to one of the sessions, you don't have to re-register, do you? That's correct. And I will be sending out a reminder for everybody who is registered. We'll go out sometime today. And so when you see that, you'll know that you are already registered. So if you're thinking about purchasing a Chromebook or you have a Chromebook or you want to learn more about your Chromebook, then um, you can certainly register and, and we'll, uh, we'll have a good time. We do an hour long presentation. We of course have done this for, I guess he was about a year now we've done this for eh? you know, it. Yeah, we're over a year, I believe. Yeah, so we've got 12 episodes up on our website. So if you wanna have a look at those, <clears throat> you can certainly do that. All right, Bob, Bob, how are you today? What's happening? Lots of things happening. We'll cover some of those things as we go along. All right. I guess the bad guys are still out there, eh? Uh, they haven't quit. <laughs> They're still busy. All right. All right. Well, we look forward to your session coming up. And of course, Dewey, Dewey, you're in the grass there. Are you, uh, are you, um, do you need a new lawnmower or what's, uh, what's going on with the grass? Well, my presentation today was a little bit in the weeds and so that's my <laughs> <laughs> Oh, gee. Ray, 
Have you got snow yet or what's happening down in the mountains? <laughs> no, though the temperature this morning was in the 50s. Oh, so really? that uh, was nice and cool. And, you know, you guys are showing off all the fancy gadgets you get. So I here's the gadget I got. Here's my phone. I put it down on a black surface. I can't find it for days sometimes. So now I got a cover that's oh, red. Bright, bright red. Ah. Don't lose my phone anymore. There you go. There you go. And uh, we talk, where's Bill? Where did Bill James go? Where'd, oh, there you are. Hi, Bill. So, Bill, you, you've got a big, you're not going to tell me what this expensive device is. You didn't buy those Ray-Ban sunglasses, did you? No. <laughs> it's something you use every day. Oh, really? You're not going to tell us what it is. You're no. going to keep it as a surprise, eh? Keep it as a surprise. <laughs> and oh, by the way, I found your background. Oh, did you? It's Ama Dablam. D A B L A M. I put it in the chat. Yeah. And on the Chromebook, when you go to the backgrounds, if you look to the right, there's a little, I think it's a little information uh, circle. You click that, it tells you. Um, oh, okay. So I'll that was show. interesting. Yeah. Okay. I think that's in Japan. What? Those big mountains? I think like that picture was in Japan. Um, it's the, um, at least it looks like it's a Japanese name. But the lake, uh, hey, uh, uh, Kayupu. Oh, Kayupu, uh, Kaharke Mountain Lake. Oh, cool. Thank you, well, Bill. I, I put it in the chat. So, just okay. look at that. Thanks, thanks a lot. It's very interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Gorgeous picture. Uh, I want to thank, um, now this, I want to thank, um, for our coffee donation fund this week. Thank you to Morris McIntyre uh, for his generous donation. Thank you, Morris. Thanks a lot. Um, we had a busy, uh, busy week this week. Um, as you know, it was the big Apple event. So, uh, you know, I was like watching those because, you know, after watching an hour of Tim Cook go, you, you just think you got to, they're so polished. Uh, you got to buy an iPhone and a, and a watch and a tablet and so on and so forth. So uh, it was sort of interesting. Um, in a nutshell, what I got out of it was uh, the iPhone 13s out and uh, not much difference. There are a few, a few small differences. The, certainly the, uh, the new Apple Watch 7 is out. Uh, no, the blood sugar uh, and blood pressure uh, is not activated on the watch. We're probably about a year out for that. So not a lot of change there. The uh, iPad mini was the thing that caught my attention, and that is really cool little device. Uh, I can see lots of applications for that, and it now comes with LTE and 5G. So I, I can see that as being a, 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 big, a, a big seller. So that was sort of interesting. Uh, the other thing that came out this week is, um, and I, I gave this to Dewey to do a little bit of investigation on, but Roku, Roku just announced their new 4K streaming stick. So this is a new application. We'll see, hopefully Dewey can um, do a little research on that and come up with some stuff on the, uh, the new Roku stick that's coming out. Uh, just a caution and word of warning to everybody, uh, in these difficult traveling times, uh, when, when aircraft uh, schedules are changing, uh, the flights are getting canceled, delayed, all sorts of stuff as people return to travel, please make sure that you are very careful on who you book your tickets through because it is not always obvious who you're booking them through. And my advice would be to book them specifically with the airline. But you may or may not know that who you're booking them with. And this creates a huge problem. And one of my friends certainly had a lot of trouble this week because they hadn't actually booked them with the airline and they thought they had. So just be careful when you're booking your tickets to book them actually with the existing airline and not through another third party service. Bob, are you ready to roll? Uh-huh. Here is the Avast Security News Roundup for the week ending September 17th, 2021. Facebook releases Ray-Ban Stories. The glasses, called Ray-Ban Stories, are designed for frictionless media capture of the world around you, according to Wired. The reporters who tried them out said the glasses are lightweight and very simple to operate. The reporters also noticed that the LED indicator light on the front of the glasses intended to alert anyone nearby that the glasses were recording is exceptionally dim. 
making it potentially easy to record covertly. This is the end of privacy in the physical world, commented of asks Lewis Carones. And I'm not saying this because of Facebook's disastrous mismanagement of user privacy. These are just the first of a number of smart glasses that are going to flood the market over the next several months. Devices that can record video and audio without people being aware of it. Apple releases patch against Pegasus spyware. Just a week before the newest iOS came out, Apple released a security update for iPhones, iPads, Apple Watches, and Mac computers that patches a vulnerability reportedly exploited by Pegasus spyware, put out by Israeli security company NSO Group. The zero-day, zero-click exploit, nicknamed Forced Entry, comes in the form of a malicious PDF sent via iMessage. Pegasus is a spyware capable of accessing and recording text, videos, photos, and web activity, as well as passively recording and scraping passwords on the device. For more on this story, see CNET. Phony Walmart release claims to accept Litecoin. A fake release published through a legitimate press channel announced that Walmart was going to begin accepting Litecoin cryptocurrency as payment. The phony news was amplified by several news websites and press agencies before Walmart told news outlets that the announcement was inauthentic. I guess that means it wasn't real. The Litecoin Foundation later confirmed on Twitter that no such partnership exists. Global Newswire issued a statement saying a fraudulent user account was used to issue an illegitimate press release. While the source of the release is still unknown, the price of Litecoin jumped about 30% after the announcement, before falling back down to its typical price. For more, see BBC News. AARP lists warning signs of fraudulent apps. Because fraudulent apps are so prevalent these days, apps designed to steal your data, money, identity, or all three, AARP has published a list of warning flags to help users identify these scams. At the top of the list is to consider where you got the app. If it was from any source that is not an official app store, be weary. Official app stores have security screenings, so malicious apps will usually avoid them and sell on other platforms. Another tip given by AARP is to carefully investigate what is free. Some apps, known as fleeceware, will claim to be free, but then charge the user exorbitant hidden fees. AARP also suggests reading recent reviews and comments before downloading the app. FTC warns of LGBTQ extortion scams. The U.S. Federal Trade Commission warned consumers that scammers are using LGBTQ dating apps to find victims for extortion scams. After posing as a potential romantic partner on the app, the scammer chats with you quickly sends explicit photos, and asks for similar photos in return. The FTC wrote, If you send photos, the blackmail begins. They threaten to share your conversation and photos with your friends, family, and employers, unless you pay, usually by gift card. The FTC offers the following tip to avoid the scams. Check out who you're talking to. Don't share personal information with someone you just met on a dating app. And don't pay scammers to destroy photos or conversations. This week's must read on the Avast blog. With 61% of the world's population now online, we must commit to a digital world that respects our rights and privacy and security online in order to achieve digital freedom. Avast CEO Andre Volchek explains how Avast is shaping the digital landscape.
to be a fairer, freer, more equitable place for all. Just follow the link below for that article. And that wraps up this week's Avast Security News Roundup. Stay safe, stay secure, and I'll see you again next week. Bye-bye. Thanks, Bob. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> For those of you, uh, Bob produces a lot of videos each week on security. Uh, you will find in our Tuesday newsletter uh, his article and also the uh, playlist link to all his, all his videos. So if you want to just save that in your, uh, to your computer, you will have, uh, as he produces the videos, they will automatically be in the playlist. So thanks, Bob, for all you do. And that's uh, keeping us If I us can safe. butt in for one second, that playlist is only security-related videos. I right. do lots of other videos. You Some do. of them tutorials, <laughs> Windows do. 11, all kinds of tips. So do some scouting. There you go. There you go. Thanks, Bob. All right. Let us uh, let me share my screen. And what did Dewey say he's in the weeds? Uh, we'll say here, uh, let's see what he has to say today. Good morning, friends. I'm Dewey, and my Tech Talk topic for today is a deep dive into Locast's demise. My Tech Talk last week was on the topic, Life After Locast. Locast, for all practical purposes, is dead, so you might wonder why I'm beating on a dead horse. Well, I came across a very thoughtful article on Locast last week that really piqued my interest, and I'd like to share it with you. The article was by Brian Livingston, a veteran tech writer at AskWoody.com, who was writing in his occasional public defender column. First, for this tech talk, I'll be quoting the article directly without the use of quote marks, and occasionally I'll paraphrase for purposes of brevity. I'll use brackets for clarification. <clears throat> the Locast name was short for local broadcasting. In return for a minimum monthly donation of $5.50 or $0 in the case of hardships, the interruptions would cease. Locast also provided an up to the minute channel guide. <clears throat> A consortium of plaintiffs, including ABC, Disney Enterprises, 20th Century Fox, Fox TV, NBC, and others, filed their suit in July 2019, alleging that Locast did not actually qualify under the U.S. Copyright Act's exception. On, June, on August 31, 2021, a Southern District, New York District Court judge, Louis Stanton, age 93, ruled against Locast, claiming that it didn't fully comply with an exception Congress wrote into the U.S. Con Copyright Act. The quashing of internet-based retransmission of free OTA TV holds vast implications for us and for our consumption of media on the web and elsewhere. To understand the impact of Judge Stanton's decision, we need to be clear about two completely different U.S. laws that control live video content. First, cable and TV satellite operators and satellite TV operators are required to carry OTA broadcast stations, and since 1965, has required operators that support more than 36 channels to retransmit every station in each local market. But beginning a decade ago, some broadcasters began requiring retransmission consent fees, which in 2020 amounted to a shockingly $12 billion. The average U.S. cable subscriber's bill now includes perhaps $12 to $15 monthly that is, slowly, is solely these consent fees for local channels that are broadcast free over the air. I'd like to interrupt Mr. Livingston's article for a moment to talk about retransmission consent fees that major broadcasters assess our cable TV and satellite TV providers, and they also assess streaming services like YouTube TV and Hulu with Live TV now. These fees came about a decade ago when network TV lobbyists from ABC, CBS, NBC, and so forth 
convinced the U.S. Congress to pass a law allowing them to assess cable and satellite services retransmission fees, retransmission consent fees for carrying otherwise free broadcast TV channels. Rittercommunications.com reports on their website that the amount of these retransmission fees has increased 30 times, that's 3,000% in the last decade as broadcasters charge increasingly more to retransmit their signals. The American Cable TV Operators Association estimates the RTC component may be as high as $20 monthly in 2021. I presume that major TV networks would claim that their increased costs of carrying sports is at least partially responsible for this increase. Back to Brian Livingston's article. Nonprofit organizations are specifically permitted to retransmit local signals. That's by the copyright law. Lowcast relied on a provision of the U.S. Copyright Act that had been inserted by Congress to ensure the wild, widest possible distribution of over-the-air TV signals. Retransmission is permitted, the Copyright Act says, by a government body or other nonprofit organization. Such a body is allowed to collect assessments necessary to defray the actual and reasonable costs of maintaining and operating a secondary transmission service. One judge, judge was able to undo it all. Before the August 31 ruling, Locast had managed to acquire 3,200,000 subscribers. Few of those users ever made the $5.50 monthly donations, so Locast had subscription revenue of a mere $4.37 million in 2020. Sounds like a lot, but that's about 2% of users who donated. That's not even a rounding error compared with the more than $55 billion that Disney, which owns ABC, alone takes in annually. Despite the challenges, Locast, when shut down, had made over-the-air TV stream, streaming services available in 36 TV markets areas, which encompassed 55% of the U.S. population. Locast wide coverage was quite an achievement, considering the tricky task of ensuring that its apps showed subscribers only the channels that were within their locally defined markets. In their legal complaint, the networks flatly asserted that Locast was not eligible for the reasons below for the exemption Congress had written into the Copyright Act. First, as a threshold matter, the exemption is limited to localized transmissions and thus does not extend to the defendant's inherently global internet transmissions. Hmm. Second, by competing against TV plaintiff's licenses in the market, uh, for television over the internet, they cannot prove that they make transmissions without any purpose of direct or indirect commercial advantage. Hmm. Third, defendants do not qualify for the exemption because they impose charges on their users, and those charges are neither assessments or necessary to defray the costs of operating the service. Well, contrary to the network's complaint, Locast transmissions were localized. Subscribers saw only local TV stations in their area. Brazenly, the network's lawsuit maintained that simply using the internet, a nonprofit was competing with media giants on a global level. Preposterous. Judge Stanton bought into the corporation's arguments. In his decision, he interpreted individual words of the U.S. Copyright Act in the narrowest possible way. It would have been simple for Congress to add one word to paragraph five to make it read costs of maintaining, expanding, or building and operating the secondary transmission service. But expansion is nowhere mentioned and it is therefore excluded from the short, tightly crafted grant of exemptions. Since, purport, since portions of its user payments funded Locast's expansion, its charges exceeded those 
quoting, necessary to defray the actual and reasonable costs of maintaining and operating the secondary transmission service, which is the only exemption granted in section 111A5 of the US Copyright Act. I've never heard of a nonprofit that could operate a service without first spending what funds were necessary to set it up. By ruling that maintaining and operating the service does not include creating a service in the first place, Judge Stanton gave the media giants everything they want. Apparently nonprofit low cast can't operate a free app that transmits free over the air television in more than one market area, unless it has enough money to set up every market area before requesting donations to serve subscribers there. Lowcast was founded by David Goodfriend and developed a faithful following. One user is quoted on Lowcast's website as saying, without Lowcast, my family would not have known about the tornado and flood warnings in my area in early February 2020. Lowcast is appealing Judge Stanton's ruling to a three-judge Court of Appeals panel. If successful, that may establish a broader interpretation of the Copyright Act's exemption for nonprofits. But even in the best case, low cast does not plan to restart. I think David has simply given up. Well, that's my Tech Talk story for today, and I am definitely sticking with it. Thanks for watching. Stay safe, and the good Lord willing, we'll see you next week. Well, thank you, Dewey. That was, uh, I guess, a sad experience to say that it's they're not going to restart. Uh, but thank you for that very uh, uh, informative information about that. Now, Huey, are you ready to roll? I am. And this is a result of a question from a member of the Sarasota Technology User Group. And find uh, the right one here. And we're ready to roll. Please like this video and subscribe to our channel. Email attachment limits or how to send large files. I'm Huey Poplock. You have a large file that you want or need to send. Could be a photo or several. Could be a video. Could be a large file, a PDF, an Excel, a publication, and so on and it could be any other large file. There are limitations in all of the email providers and clients. And here are some examples. Gmail is 25 megabytes. Outlook it's 10 megabytes. Yahoo Mail 25. You can see and then Outlook the maximum file size email is 20 megabytes. Mozilla, five megabytes. It gives you an offer to share files larger than the number of megabytes. iCloud mail is 20 megabytes. Email size limits usually apply on both sending and receiving emails. Why is there a maximum email size limit? Security reasons, mostly. If there were no maximum email size limits, the email server would risk to be bombarded with very large emails causing it to cease working properly. Free email address providers give low maximum email size limits, but you can increase the maximum limit by upgrading to a paid account. Your email will bounce and you will receive an email error back in your mailbox when you hit the maximum email size limit. Usually you will receive one of the following error messages. Attachment size exceeds the allowable limit, 552, message size exceeds maximum permitted, system undeliverable, message size exceeds outgoing message size limit, or something like the size of the message you are trying to send exceeds the global size limit of the server. The message was not sent. Reduce the message size and try again. Can you bypass these maximum email size limits? No. However, there are workarounds. You can zip or compress on a Mac 
a file or files. Compressing will help, but is not the alternative to be used in most cases. You just can't compress them enough. If you're an Outlook user, you can install Weight Diet for Outlook and automatically compress outgoing file attachments so they have more chances to fit. You can upload the files to be attached to a cloud storage server like Dropbox, Google Drive, or OneDrive and include the download link in your email. So how do you send larger files? To send files that exceed the limit size, use the file sending service. Although there are some differences between these services, the basics are the same. You upload a large file to a company server along with the email addresses of those individuals with whom you'd like to share the files. Those recipients are then allowed to download the files at their convenience. And here's a list of them. Let's take a look at some of the things about them. Most file sending services do offer premium fee-based packages and free feature limited uploads for smaller files. However, send this file and file mail do not offer any free services. Others offer two and four gigabytes. Mail drop has up to five gigabytes with a one terabyte limit, but the attachments expire in 30 days. What is large? It's not the size of an attachment, but rather the size of the entire email, including its body and all attachments. If you have several smaller attachments that add up to something over the limit, the result is defined as large. In addition, the size of an attached file isn't the size used in the calculation. Because of the way email encodes attachments, the result is approximately 20 to 40 percent bigger than the original. If you have a 9 megabyte file, you may find that it adds 12 megabytes to the size of your email message. Emails may travel across many servers. We think of email as a point-to-point. -point. We send, they receive. In reality, that's not how it works at all. There are several intermediaries responsible for getting messages from point A to point B. An email message can travel across many servers and machines along the way. It's not something we have control over. Email was never meant as a way to transfer large files. The ability to attach files is a convenience, but the way email works just doesn't make it an efficient way to move large files. The alternative is very simple. Upload the file somewhere and send a link. That link can be as long as 50 characters or more. Most importantly, it's much smaller than actually including the document itself, not likely to trip any attachment related filters and works with any email service or program. All your recipient needs to do is click on the link to download the file. Even better, they get to choose whether to download it at all. This can be very much appreciated on slow or metered connections. There are many possibilities, Dropbox, OneDrive, Google Drive, or MailDrop. Just remember to give the upload process enough time to actually upload the file from your machine before sharing the link with someone. Depending upon the speed of your internet connection and the size of the file, this could take some time. Dropbox works on your computer as opposed to simply using it from your web browser. You simply copy the file to be shared into a folder within Dropbox. It's a copy and paste. With OneDrive, using Windows File Explorer, you right-click on the file in your OneDrive folder, click on Share, and you will be presented with a dialog presenting some additional options. Make sure it says anyone with the link can view. Click the right pointing arrow next to it if it says edit to make sure the change. And then click copy link. The result will be similar to what you see on the screen. Not to be left out, Google Drive has the same feature as well. Right click on the file in your Google Drive folder for a context menu. 
much like OneDrive, clicking Share with Google Drive option instead will expose more options. Other file sharing and synchronization services may have similar features. What is MailDrop? MailDrop is an Apple feature that allows people to send large files such as videos, presentations, and images directly from the Mail app. This feature is available on iPhones, iPads, iPod Touch, and Macs. If services like Dropbox, OneDrive, or Google Drive aren't your thing, there are more alternatives. You may have some web space courtesy of your ISP. Check with them to see how to access it and how big it is. It's typically perfect for exactly what I described, regardless of what types of files you're passing around. If you're primarily sharing pictures, use a free photo sharing site like Google Photos, Flickr, or any of a number of other alternatives. If you're primarily sharing videos, use YouTube. If you're concerned about privacy, you can choose with whom to share your videos. If you're primarily sharing Word, Excel, and PowerPoint documents, consider using the services above anyway. Not only can you import and upload existing documents, but you can edit and collaborate in real time with others. If you have your own website, you already have a place to upload files. There's no need for them to be visible on the site. You can just upload and provide people a link. And now on to the demo. Let's take a look at one of the file sending services. I chose randomly and decided on WeTransfer. I can send up to two gigabytes for free. So let's go to our browser and go to wetransfer.com. It tells us that we can sign up or we can get the pro or we can just send files. I'm going to click that. So I don't even have to create an account. I have done so, but I don't have to. Let's go ahead. We're going to email this to me. I will use, uh, it's changing the backgrounds on us. I'll give it a title. Here is the show video. Now, I do have to upload the file to them, or I can select a folder. But let's go ahead and upload a file, and I'm going to choose one that is 914 megabytes, it's almost a gigabyte. See how long it takes to upload. Of course, I have very fast speed here. So let's go ahead and transfer. I do have more room if I wanted to add more. It's going to verify my email, so it's sending me a verification code. So I am going to check for that email, which I did on my other monitor. I just copied it. I'm going to paste it in here, and I'm going to tell verify. So it's now transferring almost a gigabyte. Okay, it is finished. It took less than three minutes to do it. But that's because I have a fast connection. I did cut out some of the time so you didn't have to sit there for the whole three minutes. When it finished, it gives me the information. I'm going to open up my email. There is the WeTransfer message, so we'll open that up. We have the message. Now I can click on Get Your Files or click the download link. Either item takes me to the same place, but let's go ahead and click uh, get your files it's ready for the download i click download it's completed it took a few minutes again because i have a very fast speed but it is almost a gigabyte if i right mouse click and show in the folder you will see that it's right here and it is 914 megabytes it's an hour almost an hour and a half video but it did download. It's ready for me to play, move into another folder, do whatever I want to do with that file. And I was able to send almost a gigabyte file very quickly and easily using one of the file transfer programs. This happens to be WeTransfer. Using OneDrive. Here's how we can transfer large files using OneDrive. Let's go ahead and open up our Windows File Explorer. And we're going to go to our desktop. Where our folder is, we're going to find a file 
and here is that video file and we want to store it out on OneDrive so the easy way to do it here is we have our OneDrive here with all of the folders we're going to find one that I have created to for TFS I have one for different people I am now going to drag this with my mouse to the for TFS it can move here but since I did it with my right mouse click, I have the choice. I get the menu. By the default, it would be move here. I'm going to copy it here. It copies it out to the cloud. And so if we click on TFS, it's there. It's in the process of uploading. This can take many minutes to many hours, depending upon your internet speed. Uploaded, you'll see a check mark next to it. Once you see that check mark, it's ready to do something. Now what we're going to do is we're going to right mouse click. And we're going to come down here to the share. Now there's two shares. The one you want is the one with the OneDrive logo there. When you click on it, it says anyone with the link can edit. If you click that, you can allow editing once they've downloaded it. You apply it. You can now put a person's name there or just hit the copy link. It'll copy it. So now I have a copy of that just to show you what it looks like. And this is the link for that file. Now I can paste that into an email, send it to somebody, and they can download it and have access to that file. That's all there is in OneDrive. It's very simple, very easy. To send a file with Gmail is quite easy. You create a new email, put the information you want, come down here to Insert Files Using Drive, click on it, you want to find the folder that you're looking for, which is here. Here is the file that we want because you selected more than 25 megabytes to attach this file. The selected attachments will be shared via a drive link. Click insert, sign your name, and send it. Someone needs access to the file. You can share it with one person. Turn the link sharing on. Anyone with the link can view. Click that and go ahead and send. And that's it. On the other end, the email was received and included in the email is a link. You click on that link and it will download or open that file. Thanks for joining us. I'm Huey Poplock. There we go. Uh, thanks, Huey. That's great. Uh, we look forward to trying some of those. So what's with WeTransfer? I don't quite, because we would all have Google Drive or OneDrive. Do you think WeTransfers, would we use that very much or? Well, some people don't use OneDrive, and they, some people don't use Google Drive. If mm -hmm. they don't or they prefer to use a, a, a private company, they can. And uh, uh, it, you can do, like, some of them up to two gigabytes or four gigabytes mm -hmm. uh, for free. And this particular one, you didn't even have to create a, uh, an account. Yeah, okay. Well, all right, so I've got something a little lighthearted for you. We're going to do a bit of exercise today. So uh, enough of this uh, heavy technology stuff. Uh, let's see what I've got here. It's Ron Brown with Tech for Seniors. Let's go for a little ride on my e-bike as we take a tour around Comox, British Columbia on Vancouver Island where I live. I'm gonna show you my new e-bike. This is my bike, it's called a Volt 750. And you can see cameras one and two are mounted on the front and camera three on the rear. Let's have a look at this and I'll show you how I've put it together. Now, before we talk about my bike, there are many different types of e-bikes that you can purchase. And if you read our Tech for Senior Facebook page today, you will realize that Harley Davidson's stunning vintage inspired electric bikes are going on sale later this year. Harley Davidson said it would only make 650 units, half of which would be available in the United States. Very beautiful bike. Also BMW and Cube Bicycles plan an urban mobility takeover with a concept dynamic cargo e-bike. This is gonna be really interesting. Makes it easy for bringing the groceries home. 
And this was just announced, FedEx is launching new e-bikes in Mississauga and Oakville, Ontario, as part of the company's mission to achieve carbon neutrality. By 2040, FedEx announced they will be implementing e-bikes in certain urban settings, including six in Toronto and two in Mississauga and Oakville. Pretty interesting. So there is an e-bike for you. Doesn't matter how well you ride or the age you are, e-bikes are amazing. So this is my e-bike. It's called a Volt bike, V-O-L-T bike, and the model is Yukon 750 Limited. I purchased it in June of last year, and the cost was $2,149 Canadian. Now, how is this powered? You all wanna know how far it will go and how fast. Now the power. There's uh, 750 watts of peak power. This is powered by the Bafang motor, which is the world's largest manufacturer of hub motors for e-bikes. The Volt Bike Yukon 750 is using a Bafang G06 series motor that will give 700 watts of power. Now the top speed of this is around 32 kilometers an hour, which I think is probably around 20 miles an hour, anybody but I've had it up to 30 miles an hour and it's still got power left in it so this thing goes like stink now the Volt bike has a uh, battery in it this is made by Samsung now the Volt bike Yukon 750 is using a Samsung battery this is a 48 volt battery and can get about 60 to 80 kilometers or about 50 miles for a charge now the brakes on this bike are made by a company called Tektro and they are hydraulic. The tires on this bike are very large. You're probably wondering what the heck is going on here. These are fat tire puncture resistant tires. Now the interesting thing about this was when I got the bike, it was all supposed to be um, checked out and I assumed it would have air in the tires. So I rode it for two months and I thought it had a great ride, And I, but and it was a soft ride. I was bouncing along as I rode the bike. Well, when I checked the tire pressure, ultimately there was no air in the tires. So these tires are meant to be either you can have from zero to 30 pounds of pressure in these tires. I currently keeping it about 20 pounds. They are punctureless. And if you did, um, if you did lose air in the tires, you could ride home as I did for two months. The controls uh, for this are simple controls. Their redesigned cockpit includes large, easy to read LCD screen, which shows the all important information, which includes speed, battery level, and current load. Get instant power with the integrated half twist throttle, which is on the right side, and an on and off button, which helps prevent accidental activation. <laughs> the problem with the handlebar on this bike, there's not a lot of real estate to put things on. You have your uh, throttle controls, your LCD screen, and a bell. So I purchased a handlebar extender which allows me to put the two cameras that you see on the uh, on the top now the other camera that you saw on the top of the handlebar is called a Kaiser Bass X600 I've expanded I experimented around with my cell phone and found um, that it uh, the image stabilization just wasn't good enough for the jostling around on my bike. So I didn't want to buy a GoPro camera, too expensive, so I bought the uh, Kaiser Bass X600. This is mostly sold in, um, in, in Europe and in Australia, not sold much in the United States, but it gets very good reviews, and I've been very happy with the results. It, uh, it does shoot in 4K, and has a very good uh, image stabilization. 
the cost was around $180 and it simply mounts as you saw on my front handlebars. Now on the back of the bike, you'll see I have a DJI mini camera. Now this is uh, so I can get different shots from either directly behind me or looking back at me. This is camera is image stabilized and is on a gimbal and it's called the DJI Mini. And this is, uh, has provided some very interesting shots and it either can give me forward or rear facing shots. This is the uh, this is the the DJI Pocket. I purchased it for three hundred and forty nine dollars Canadian. Today it is on uh, Amazon, uh, and Canadian price is around four hundred and sixty dollars. Well, we're home from the ride. That was my Volt seven fifty e bike. Remember the like and subscribe. And until we see again, have a great day. Ron Brown with Tech for Seniors. All right, there we go. A little bit of exercise for everyone this morning uh, after uh, after the tech talk. So uh, that was my uh, that was my uh, uh, e-bike. Um, we can talk about that maybe in the um, in, if you have any questions, we'll talk about it in the Q and A. Ray, just as I say goodbye to our YouTube friends, do you uh, you can get ready to go? Uh, thank okay, you. I will. Those people who are over on our YouTube feed, uh, thanks for coming. We'll see you again in about another um, another week. Uh, we have uh, three spots left over on our uh, on our Zoom meeting. So if you want to pop over here, the first three can get in and participate in the Q&A. Ray, I'm just going to stop the, uh, the feed now. Okay. And you can go. You are ready to roll. Thank you, sir. Today I'm going to talk about who I think is the best song storyteller. And that would be a gentleman named John Prime. Now, I'm somewhat embarrassed to admit that until I moved to Arizona in the mid 2000s and made some new friends, uh, thank you, Jim and Randy, I never heard of John Prime. For all the folk music I collected over the years, I do not have an explanation as to how I could have missed this storytelling giant. Prime was born in October of 1946, raised in Maywood, Illinois. He credits film critic Roger Ebert and singer songwriter Chris Christopherson with his discovery and convincing him to leave his mailman delivery job behind and proceed with writing and singing full time. According to Wikipedia, John Prine is widely cited as one of the most influential songwriters of his generation, known for humorous lyrics about love, life, and current events, as well as serious songs with social commentary and songs that recollect melancholy tales from his life. This resulted in his receiving in 2020, the Grammy Life Achievement Award. Now Prime's first self-titled album was released in 1971 and he continued recording and performing over the next several decades. However, starting in the late 90, Prime was diagnosed with a cancer that affected his neck and tongue. Amazingly, he recovered and resumed performing only to find that in 2013, he needed to undergo another surgery to remove more cancer. Yet six months later, he was singing. Now, while John Prine could be considered the definition for the word perseverance, the pandemic we are all facing finally caught up with him and he died on April 7, 2020 from complications caused by COVID-19 at the age of 73. Now, probably the reason one might not have heard many of John's songs on commercial radio is that they are mostly eight to 10 minutes and longer in length. But I found one on YouTube that is shorter than most and is so appropriately titled for today, being the last day of summer. It's called John Prine Summer's End Official Video. Now the song Summer's End originally appeared on Prine's final album in 2018 that was titled The Tree of Forgiveness and was specifically written to address the opioid crisis this country is facing. Now keep that in mind, the opioid crisis, keep that in mind when you listen to the repeated stanza, come on home so you don't have to be alone. It earned a Best American Root Song nomination during the 2018 Grammy Awards and was named Best Song of 2018 by the American Songwriter Magazine.
you go. Um, Excellent. Thank you so oh, much. Yep. Yeah, glad to have presented that. <laughs> Very good. Yes. Well, it's uh, top of the hour. Wow, we nailed it right at right at top of the hour. Wow, how's that for? Uh, <laughs> you know, we're not even over by one second. Wow, good planning, all as I can say. You know, so uh, I want to thank everyone for being here uh, and coming to the show today. We're going to be moving into our question and answer phase now. Uh, before we get there, I want to thank you. If you have to leave. Uh, certainly remember that uh, this coming Thursday, we have a learning Chromebooks. You and I, of course, will be doing a, uh, the, that, show, that show for about an hour. And also Tech for Senior Live will be on. And of course, we have uh, Jim Gould from that famous, uh, um, famous button show that's on every Monday from Geeks on Tour. Uh, my favorite, my second favorite show in the whole world. I guess I better put Huey's on first, right? Or uh, how am I going to politically do Am I just digging myself in here? Uh -oh. oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Jim. So anyway, so uh, well, anyway, uh, we, we um, please, uh, please watch us on Thursday. Jim's always lots of fun to have on the show. And we will, uh, we'll open the um, question and answer now. If you can just uh, go down to the reactions button on your uh, on your Zoom. And if you want to raise your hand, just click on raise your hand and that'll bring you up to the top and we can see you and answer your questions. And uh, we had a few questions before we didn't get to answer them. Uh, Jerry, um, which question did you have again? Sorry, can you repeat, rephrase it? Okay, if you take a look at the participants or like in file manager, the font or the uh, size is very small. Is there any way you can make it larger? You know, if you're in Windows or Word or Excel, you hold the control key down and hit the scroll on the mouse and it will increase the, the font size, but this is not possible. Uh, Bill had said he had an answer to that. Is Bill James here? Does Bill have an answer to that? Yeah. You know, um, Jerry, it depends on what you're looking at. If you go to a file manager, you can go to the view. I'm going to share my screen. Do you want to share your screen? Do you want yeah. to join me? I'll, I'll let you share. Just hold on a sec. Let me. Uh, yo, there we go. Let me call us. There you go. There you go. You should be able to share your screen now. All right. You can go up to um, the view. The view. And, and you have choices of what size icons you want. You can get up to that size. I think I tried that. And that didn't... I'm not after the icons. I'm after the text message itself. On the, on the left side? Yeah. Uh, I, the only way you're going to be able to do that is go in and change the... Um, go to accessibilities and um, change your... Um, I think I've tried that too. And that doesn't work? I don't think so. All right, let's see here. Uh, you got the slider there where you can make. Yeah, no. Uh, that, that's like for Windows and that, not for uh, file manager. It'll change everything. Yeah, yeah. that'll change everything. Um, There are some magnifiers that you can use, but yeah, the magnifier is right here. And then you also, I don't know, this right here. Yeah, uh, you, let's you, just let's you, just move that and see what happens. That, that changes that changes it some. I know, but that will take and change everything on Windows and Word and everything like exactly. that. Exactly. That's a true statement. So I, I guess what I was referring to when I when I said I had a solution was actually was looking at the, um, the icons themselves and yeah. not uh, looking at the text. So I don't think you can actually... Uh, do any more than what we have already suggested. Okay. Uh, just a quick question, Ron and uh, Huey. 
can I use those videos to show at our computer club? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That's why we put them up there for you. Okay. Absolutely. okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I might just add one thing on. I eat sometimes to make my screen larger and what's there. Just temporarily hit control and the plus uh, key on the keyboard, and that will enlarge it. And then when I'm done to bring it back to the size I wanted, I hit control and the minus key. Yeah, yeah but right. that, that, that doesn't affect. Uh, that doesn't work in File uh, Explorer. Right. Um, That's just I mean, like that, uh, doing a scroll, hitting control and uh, the scroll on the mouse. Yeah, plus or minus is the same as up or down on the scroll. On the, yeah. On the mouse, correct. Now, if you have a touch screen, you can go in like I'm doing and um, just, well, that only works in one part of it. It doesn't work on the left side. It wor does work. Yeah, the middle side where you can pinch and uh, cause it to. Um, yeah. I don't have a touch screen on both of my PCs. There is a program, and I'm trying to see what it's called. I've got it installed, but there's something that's over it. Um, I'll have to look my up. My hand up. Let's see if they choose me next because there's a guy, two guys in front of me. All right. Uh, is that is that helpful, Jerry? Then we'll get yeah, to yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you. I apologize, Thanks a lot. Jerry, for not having more information. I'll I'll look up some things and see if I can find something to help you. Okay. Thanks, Bill H. Go ahead. Yes. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I was curious, Ron. How did the brakes stop in the rain with your electric bike, and can they lock up the tires or? If you're going that fast, it seems like there'd be a little bit of a danger there. Um, so first of all, I don't ride my bike in the rain. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's, that's why you go to Arizona. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. So the, the second question, though, is they're hydraulic brakes. So unlike disc, unlike a brakes that you like friction brakes that you'd have on your bike, these are hydraulic and uh, they, they have big discs on them. And so because uh, it is. You know, the bike is a very heavy bike like that bike. Uh, I would not recommend that particular bike for for seniors um, because it's that bike is 70 pounds. Right. It's a very heavy bike. And I'm not going to tell you how much it weighs with me sitting on it, but it weighs <laughs> considerably more. And when you get flying down a hill going with that much mass at very fast speed, you know, 30 miles an hour, it's pretty darn fast if you're going down there. You want to be able to stop for sure. And, uh, and that's why you need some good brakes on it. I'm not sure if all e-bikes have hydraulic brakes, but these are uh, hydraulic. So they're not, um, there's no cable linking them. It's, it's a hydraulic link. And so not much pressure on the brakes and you can stop pretty quick. So I don't have any trouble. I don't have any trouble stopping. I recall doing the flip over the front with the old uh, brakes when they grabbed the uh, wrong. Yeah, yeah. This I think the hydraulic makes it a little easier because uh, they they don't stick or grab like the uh, like the old discs, you know, the where you had the calipers on your on your tires. So it doesn't seem to be doesn't seem to be a problem. But you know, the, the um, I guess the question is, there are e bikes for everybody, and you know, the trike is a good idea. You know, if you just want to pop up to the grocery store and get some get some groceries and come back, then then you don't have to get a two wheel, you get a trike, you know, and well, you, you put can, all the stuff. There's all, all the stuff that you can, uh, and you can go in, uh, you put it in the cargo container in the back and, and away you go. Uh, there, um, there are storage units on the side of my bike. One of the problems I, d I don't like about my bike is, my e-bike is, is to take it up for the, to go in and buy some uh, milk at a grocery store or something, is it, to lock it up and take all the stuff off it and try and secure it. Securing an e-bike is really hard. And uh, unless it's really stripped down, it's, it's not that easy to do. And I end up uh, using my e-bike mostly for fun and, and photography and, and driving around in it. But, uh, but from a practical point of view, I'd have to strip it right down if I was going to use it just to go up and get some groceries. Hmm. Okay, Thank thanks. You. Back okay. in 64, when I bought my first new car, I paid less for that car than you paid for that e-bike. I know, I know, I know. Well, hey, Bob, it's like cars now. You can get e-bikes 
they go up to twenty, thirty thousand dollars. It's you yeah. know, it's 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 just what you want on them. I mean, it, 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 there are probably as many e-bikes now as there are cars around, like as far as varieties. Uh, so um, so you you know that's 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 uh, lots of choice. Uh, Carl, yeah, go so, ahead. Yeah. Car- Carl, Bob, I now pay more for a car than I did for my first house. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Carl, go ahead. Yeah, I want, I want to get back to the duck, duck, go with uh, Bob and oh, Bill yeah. or whoever. How do I know I have it installed? Number one, I I thought there was Bob or Bill. There was some sort of icon supposed to be in my tray that told me I had it, but I don't know if I have it or not. Only in your settings. That's where you'll find out whether you have it. Is it set as your default search engine in your settings? Okay. All right. So if if you open up your browser and look at your settings under uh-huh. search, what is the default uh, search engine? And that's yes. where you'll find, and that's where you also select it because it's there as an item to be selected. When you say uh, earlier about going to the search on the, the to- top bar, right. I mean, hold on a second. You were going to show me that. Yep. While he's doing that, Jerry says I did put a link for a program that might help you with magnifying. Okay, thank you. I had to turn magnifying off, Huey, because every time I'd move my mouse, the screen would change size. It drove me nuts. Oh, I know. <laughs> I, that's why I don't use it a lot either. Okay, I have the Google browser open now. Now, you see this, not this search bar. No, all we're seeing is, that your, is- your background. You should have been seeing my, okay, let me go out and come back in and just share it that way. Stop share. Share screen. You know, you get it this way. Okay. There you go. There you go. Sharing a Google, your Google browser, your Chrome browser. This one here, that's Google. Right. Okay. It says search Google. But up on top over here, if you go into your settings and then go to search engine, right now it's set for Google. Right. But I can go down here and I can pick, there's DuckDuckGo. If I select it, now when I go up here and I do a search, Oh, I went to someplace I didn't want to go. Just open it. Yeah. Open a new tab, Bob. Yeah, that should get it done. No, it's still going to do the same thing because, okay. There you go. There it is. Up. The, icons. the icon right up here and the icon over here says duck, duck, go. Right. So if okay. I do the search, what it brings up is in DuckDuckGo, okay? Got it. That's where I, I had read or heard that you would see the icon for it. Now I know where to look and how to do it. Thank right. you very All much. Right. You did great, Bob. All righty. Thanks, Bob. Bill James, you had a question Question or comment? Oh, I was uh, just a comment. I was going to say, um, per your request, I'll be writing the article on the Mercedes e-bike tomorrow. And... Uh, you can buy uh, several cars for what it costs. <laughs> and the other thing is, um, wh- how much exercise would we get from using an e-bike? Z- uh, well, that's a very good question. You Getting know, on uh, and off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It depends how much you use. Well, first of all, um, I would tell you on my bike, is very heavy bike, it's very difficult to pedal. All right. Um, you would, you know, it's really sort of meant to be used as an e-bike. I guess the lighter the bike it is, then you could do uh, like a hybrid bike. You could pedal and not use the throttle. Uh, but mine is a very, very heavy bike. And it uh, you'd be really hoofing it to try and make that go without power. So uh, but some of the lighter bikes uh, you could you can you can turn the uh, you, you can pedal them and, and certainly without you don't have to use power. Okay. Look for my order Linda, tomorrow. Yeah, Lon, uh, Ron Linda Belcher put in the uh, chat box. Anyone have a recommendation for types 
or manufacturers of safety helmets. That might make a good video for you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That was uh, the one that came with my bike that you saw me wearing <laughs> is actually a motorcycle helmet. It's actually a, a, a motorcycle helmet, which is, uh, I thought that was interesting. Uh, let's have a look here. Dick, uh, Dick, you're next. Dick Vogel. Yes, I, I have two things. One, uh, the uh, type uh, size that is displayed can be changed if you go to your screen and right click on a screen and check and click on display settings. And then if you scroll down, you'll see change the size of text. And you'll, uh, if, if you increase it there, it may uh, solve this problem. That's not in the browser though. Thank you. Not, not in Explorer. When you open Explorer, you won't have that choice. Okay. Okay, I have a second point then. Uh, sometimes in your presentations, you have links that you display, but those links are not easily copied. Do you have, can you work on a way that those links can be uh, found easily either in the chat or some other way so that we can uh, refer to them? Because once, once your presentation is over, that link is gone. That link is what's as part of the uh, information that's shared when you go to the actual video. And th there is always a part in a video underneath that gives you more information. You'll find the link listed in there. Excellent. Thank you. But Dick, do you know how to save your chat? Yes, I'm saving chats all the time. Okay. It should be and, in the newsletter too. And Good George, point. George, go ahead. There we go. Okay. Um, I've been riding e-bikes for a couple of years. Um, and a couple of things you should know. I live in Victoria, so we have good bike lanes. Well, people should be, be polite with their e-bikes on, on shared pedestrian bike lane areas. Um, but uh, the, the buses uh, don't let you put e-bikes in Victoria on the front of their buses, okay? So if you're thinking of using the e-bike at the end of your trip, that doesn't work. I'm on my third tank of gas since COVID began because I have not used the, the, the van hardly at all, okay? Uh, so you will save a lot of money in that respect. Um, but uh, it's right. I'm I'm not getting the exercise I used to get on my pedal bike. <laughs> yeah. The other thing, the other thing, George, that's interesting is in considering an e-bike. One of the things that you need really need to think about is the weight and how you're going to transport it, because most of these bikes are heavy and they won't really transport well on the traditional bike carrier that goes on the back of your car, and so you have to think. Think about that. Now, some of them, I think uh, Jim Gould was telling me about his. He has one that uh, he folds and sticks in the back of his car, which, uh, Jim, do you like You like that? Are you, that's the one you use? Well, actually, we have two, or we had two, <laughs> uh, folding electric bikes that we uh, put on a rack. I modified a bicycle rack so it fits both bikes hanging off the back of the uh, RV, of our van camper right. and but when i was getting ready for our summer tour this year one of my my motors was flooded and it wasn't going to work chris's was fine but we decided to take our regular trek bicycles our our bicycle bicycles right. and and we had a good time with them we got a lot more exercise that way. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh yeah uh -huh. the only time i really like the e-bike over a regular bike, a pedal bike, is when you're in hilly areas and, you know, but we just don't ride there anymore. Yeah, the, the folding meant that they did take up less space, but they're still heavy. I mean, they I are, could yeah. not lift it. I could they not are. lift it up into the car or onto the rack. It's only 45 pounds each. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, well when listen. you took the bat, you had to take the battery off and and the seats and and they fold it up and but yeah, she's a winner. <laughs> Dorothy, Dorothy, did you have one quick question? Yeah, we got to go soon. Uh, just a quick comment. I've had an e-bike for three years, and mine's a pedal assist, so I do get a lot of exercise right. because I put it in a lower speed, so it makes my legs work. But when I need it for a hill, I put it in turbo and high speeds or low speed so I can get up a hill. But also if you're getting a bike rack, there are bike racks that are meant just for e-bikes right. to hold, right. but they right. have ramps on them. That's as well. right. They, they, yeah. They're supported underneath rather than hanging. Yeah. 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 And, and I must, uh, you know, <laughs> when I turn my power up to nine, it's one to nine. When I turn it to nine, you know, I just have to turn that pedal just so little and I get lots of power. I don't have to put a lot of work into it. So <laughs> I don't work it. I don't work out. Gail, I come back. Gail says, you don't even look sweaty. You didn't put much effort into that ride. And I think, oh, gosh. <laughs> anyway. Hey, listen, it's 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 20 past. For those of you, we got to we got to run. I'm, I'm glad that uh, uh, Jim's here because, of course, Jim will be on our uh, show on on uh, on Thursday. Thanks for, for that. Uh, Jim, we'll see you uh, see you on Thursday. We'll have a lot of fun talking about all the latest tech articles. For those of you remember in 10 minutes uh, on the uh, uh, on our premiere service uh, over on our um, on our YouTube site, uh, we will we will be talking about file management and I'll be talking about purchase considerations for a new computer. Until that, we'll see everyone next week, same time, same place. Uh, thanks for coming and uh, and stay safe. Bye now. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. Bye bye.